and welcome. I'm glad to have a chance to speak with you today at Cloud Bazaar. I'm truly honored. Myself, I'm Mark Birch. I'm a principal startup advocate for Asia Pacific at AWS. And if you wish, you can follow me on my various social handles. This evening, I want to share some ideas around the current state of sales, what the future looks like, and why authenticity matters. Based on my many years as a startup founder, a salesperson, and an organizer of a global sales community called the Enterprise Sales Forum. And I want to start with something that you might not know. 74% of B2B salespeople are mediocre to awful at selling. What? <laughs> what? Does that amaze you? Are you stunned? Do you want to just fall over in your chairs? That's crazy. Dave Curlin of Objective Management Group evaluated over 700,000 salespeople over the past 24 years, and the data is definitive. Three quarters of salespeople suck. In what other profession would this be acceptable that a large percentage of your workforce would be inept at the very thing that they're doing for a living? Imagine if that was the case for doctors or civil engineers or safety inspectors. But in sales, this is okay, and we've kind of tacitly accepted the reality that sales is broken. We let go of the bottom 20% every year, we hire new reps, we review deals, pipelines, forecasts, just to rinse and repeat year after year. Then 2020 happened. It took what was already a broken model and it blew it up. Budget slash, prospects ghosting reps, meetings canceled, pipeline shriveled up, deals that were sure things vanished, all through mass layoffs and bankruptcies. Whether we wanted to or not, as business leaders, we needed to change and fast. Take India, for example. With a lack of face-to-face -face meetings to build up rapport and build relationships, India went on full-on digital. And what was interesting is that the data showed in this McKinsey study that the buyers, they don't want to see reps in person. They actually prefer the digital and self-service sales channels. And 95% of decision makers see digital sales as the future. They're okay buying big ticket items online. And whereas in the past, the phone was the was a tool of choice for sales reps, buyers are asking for video calls because even in this digital sales era, even over the internet, the personal touch matters. Despite this, across South Asia and Southeast Asia, the effectiveness of digital sales is a real, real struggle. Nearly half say it's less effective in reaching and serving customers. But if we just think about what I just said about Dave Curlin and his studies around sales reps, that three quarters of sales reps are just not very good, the data is actually confirming this and showing that those reps are actually uh, as just as ineffective or even worse in 2020. But one quarter of those sales reps are thriving. Why is that? When I work with sales leaders, founders, startups, the one thing becomes immediately clear between what makes for an effective team and, and an ineffective team. Dale Carnegie, who is the author of this seminal book called How to Win Friends and Influence People, made this observation over 80 years ago. And he said that the only way to influence people is to talk about what they want and show them how to get it. And let's face it, the fundamental truth is that we're all narcissists. Even as much as we want to be humble or say that we're humble, we love hearing about ourselves, talking about our concerns, what we care about. And winning sales teams, they not only recognize this, but they act on it. Mediocre sales teams, they don't even notice. So to become effective in this digital selling world, there are three fundamental principles that effective sales teams are doing and that we all need to understand. First is trust. You need to be trustworthy. We can only be trustworthy though, if we're willing to help. Oftentimes, how often are we pushing our own agenda in every call and meeting, instead of taking time to listen to customers, spend time learning about they, what they care about, what motivates them, what they want to achieve. We also need to be reliable. 
as professionals and follow things on the say that we on the things that we say we'll do. So many times I'll hear a founder or a sales rep say they're going to follow up and then fail to follow up. Do not be that person. Be the person that can be trusted to keep your word. I can't tell you how many times I've been in sales meetings and I just see a salesperson get asked a question and they fumble it. And it's painful to watch. I remember uh, one meeting years ago, it's still stuck in my brain. I was a sales engineer at a big enterprise sales company or enterprise tech company. And I was with a sales rep and we're having a, a good demo, a good meeting. And then the head of IT asks, hey, what is your support for data warehouses? Well, whereas I probably would have and should have actually chimed in, the salesperson barged in with this whole spiel about databases. The head of IT just shakes his head and says, guy, that's not what I asked. And we lost complete credibility for the rest of the meeting. So part of being trustworthy is not only just having knowledge and expertise, but also knowing what limits you have. It's okay sometimes to say, I don't know, let me get back to you. That's how we build actual credibility. Now, building trust and credibility, those are critical principles, but it's rapport that brings it all together. That's the relational side of sales, the warm, fuzzy side, where we're empathizing, understanding, creating bonds, whether digital or in-person. We are all ultimately people that buy from people. But that does not mean we get into the friend zone with our customers. What it does mean is that we make customers feel that we generally care about their interests. Right? And that's exactly what Dale Carnegie was saying about influence. We can only influence and change the minds of our customers when we first take an interest in them. When we put trust, credibility, we're poor all together. These are the building blocks of authenticity. And this is the idea that truly elevates the great sales teams from the ones that struggle. Now, in the past, lousy sales teams, they could get away with just doing the same old thing because they were playing the volume game. If you do something enough times, something's going to work, right? Throw spaghetti at a wall, some of it will stick. So I see lots of teams, they'll do 100 calls, 100 emails, they'll get a few meetings and maybe out of that get one deal. But now in 2020, that world is gone completely digital and buyers are flooded with sales reps, calls, emails, pitches, everyone doing the same thing. And it just doesn't work anymore. It's not sustainable. It's annoying prospects. It's ruining your brand. And we've got to get out of this vicious cycle. And the only way to do that is to sell with authenticity. So for the rest of this talk, I want to share some of the things that I found to be effective ways to sell with authenticity, to elevate your sales efforts, and to really elevate your brand in the eyes of prospects and customers. Not as a salesperson that's in it for him or herself, or a founder aggressively pushing this product that they themselves love, but to be confident advisors that are trusted to help in God. So, what do you believe in? Do you truly believe in the thing that you're selling? As an entrepreneur, are you really in it? As Simon Sinek said in his book, Start With Why, ultimately authenticity starts with our beliefs. So ask yourself if what you're doing is really your calling. Are you passionate about it? Do you wake up really excited for the day? And if that's the case, is it something that you're truly selling that you're believing in. If we're not excited about the company, the products, the ideas, customers pick up on that very quickly. It's like going to a fast food restaurant. We know that's going to be fast. It's going to be cheap, but it's not going to be great food because it's mass produced by workers that don't really care about the quality and the experience. And that's exactly how most customers view salespeople. They just feel that it's kind of just fast food. Don't be fast food. Be someone who truly believes in what you're doing. Be brutally honest and introspect on the things that you truly care about. Now, I'm not sure about you, but I get lots of cold emails and, and cold calls from sales reps and they, they all suffer from the same terrible thing. They want me to sacrifice 15 to 20 minutes of my time for something I'm not even sure I care about. What's the benefit for me? How are you helping me out? Same thing happens with demos. 
90% plow through their, their scripts, never asking a question. Maybe 9% will ask a few questions, but they still lean into the demo. It's still about their show, their product. But then there's that 1%, they flip it all around. And the experience is almost like being in a, in a coffee shop with your friends talking about work stuff. So we've got to be able to recraft our approach and our messaging to be other oriented from me oriented. You can't get people interested in what you sell until you are other oriented. Be the one that's helpful, roll up your sleeves, dig deep to solve problems that customers have. One of the exercises I do with entrepreneurs is why should I care? It's a game where they give me a short pitch and then I keep asking why until we actually get to something that I as a potential customer would care about. Well, this one startup I was working with uh, years ago, they were creating a mobile customer relationship management app or a CRM app. And so we played the game and I said, what's your pitch? And they were like, oh, it's so cool. We're creating the very first fully mobile CRM application for sales reps and teams. It's awesome. I said, okay, I'm a sales rep. Why do I care? I'm a, I'm a sales manager. What is, why does this matter? I'm a CFO. We already have Salesforce. Why would I buy yet another thing? After an hour, we finally kind of hashed things out. We got some, we got back to the why of why I should care. And it's because you start with the customer. When you start with the customer's problem and you work backwards, something we do quite a bit here at, uh, at AWS, you finally get to the thing that really matters. And the way that you can, you can really emphasize that customer concern and problem is thinking about it more from telling a story. Unfortunately, a lot of the stories that we have about our customers are so boring. I mean, you read these testimonials, you read these customer case studies, and it's so full of marketing language and jargon. Instead, take a different approach to your storytelling. Take the hero's journey approach. You know, like uh, many of our most famous movies, the movies that we love, they all revolve around a story arc. You know, just like the example of this uh, sci-fi movie you may have heard about, where it is a boy on a dusty, dull farm, looking up at the stars, wanting to explore. Then he has to go on a search for a missing droid. And then all of a sudden, he's getting roped into this crazy plan to defeat the evil Galactic Empire. Those stories draw people in. They're interesting. They have heroes. They have enemies. Craft stories that customers can be really intrigued and fall into to care about. There's this growing movement called building a public. It's something that you hear a lot or see a lot with startups where founders are being very public about what they're building as opposed to being very stealth-like. And we can also be more public about what work we do and use social platforms like LinkedIn or Twitter or what have you to share more often. And that's exactly what I do with my own newsletters, the Enterprise Sales Forum newsletter, DevBizOps. And I share the things that I'm hearing from my customers and prospects and other meetings and, and conversations I have. So embrace sharing more in public and be willing to share those customer stories, things you're learning in your sales, the challenges you face, the cool tools you're using, video testimonials, because when buyers look at your online profiles, they're going to see that and they're going to see problem solvers as opposed to salespeople pushing product. Now, being active on social media can, for a lot of people, it feels unnatural. It feels challenging almost. And it's because we tend to fall into the same traps. And a lot of the stuff I see, like 95% of it on social media, is oftentimes people just using it to brag, boast, to barge into the lives of, of other people. So the very first rule of social media is lose the automation. It doesn't work. I get dozens of requests on LinkedIn every week, and maybe 3% are personalized and genuine. The 97% can templates, no introductions, product pitches for virtual assistants, offshore development work, lead gen services, video explainer videos, you need to be authentic over social media. And what that means is be, be involved and be personal. Follow, get to know people before you ever make a pitch. Get involved in online discussion. Share other people's posts. 
and share or offer insights that aren't your product pitches where appropriate. And this may seem like a lot of work, a lot of time, but what you're doing is you're investing in the long game. You're building trust, credibility, rapport, and a stronger network that's gonna listen to you down the road and care about your interests. Now, whether you're in social media or engaging one-on-one -on -one with customers, it's important to bring your whole self, your whole personality into what you do. I often see this weird, uh, this weird thing where people have my business persona and then they have my personal persona. And we hide what is truly unique and interesting about ourselves. And those things are critical for being authentic and building rapport. It's like this, uh, this ad campaign for a beer company. It was called The Most Interesting Man in the World. And it was a hit because the stories and the quotes seem so interesting and over the top. Now, you don't need to have sandwiches named for yourself all over the world or be fluent in every language, but being more of yourself allows for that connection. And that was really the value of small talk for uh, you know, when we had meetings with customers. And it would give us opportunities to share in those small moments things about ourselves, learn about things from our customers that can help better inform the ways that we're gonna engage in the sales cycle. So, you know, of all the products that you pitch, all the features you talk about, the thing that customers honestly remember the most about you, it's the things that you said, the things that you shared, what they remember about you. Now, often when I'm presenting ideas, I, I go from the customer problem perspective and I work backwards. But this trap that many salespeople work from is they start from the product outward to the customer. And that's, that's the me-centric approach. The other centric approach is to really start with the problem, look at the business challenges, the technology challenges, and bring, bring unique perspectives and ideas to help solve the pain point. That's what's gonna get people interested in listening more. There's a really fascinating book called Thinking Fast and Slow by the economist Daniel Kahneman. And he shows that our brains have these, these two systems. System one, which processes all the inbound and makes really fast decisions, but doesn't really think about things. It's kind of like the, uh, kind of like the, uh, the velvet rope at the club. Some things get in, most don't. But then there's a system two, it's very analytical. That's where we do our deep thinking. When we, do, when we talk about stories and we bring novel ideas, it actually is able to bypass that system one. It you know, bypasses the bouncer at the club to hit that analytical mind and to stick. That's how you do it through the stories and by presenting novel ideas. But we can also fall in the trap of coming off as arrogant know-it-alls. We wanna be able to challenge preconceived notions or ideas and challenge the status quo that, of ways that your customer may be viewing the world, but you gotta do that with empathy. There's a great book called The Challenger Sale, which talks all about the different types of salespeople and the ones that tend to be more effective are ones that challenge the customer, but they don't challenge by being, uh, by being arrogant. They challenge by introducing ideas with empathy, by subtly suggesting ideas using open-ended questions that help lead a customer to finding the path that eventually gets to your solution. So the last idea I wanna share in this talk tonight is this idea of a channel that's been developing over many, many years, but we seem to not see it as salespeople or entrepreneurs or founders. And it's a channel called community. Community is simply a group of people with shared interests and values, but what differentiates your customer base, your audience from what a community is, is that they're shared values. And that in the people, in those communities, there are people that are helping, sharing, collaborating, contributing. And you see this with really successful product groups in the open source community where different groups come together and different people come together to generate the content like in Q and A or forum sites. We also need to be cautious because communities built around vendors and solutions can be really fragile. Any perception of a heavy sales or marketing influence can destroy all trust in the community and impact your, your brand negatively. 
you know, luckily, a lot of the ideas I just shared about authenticity help to bridge the gap between community and being involved from a, a sales perspective. That means how to be other oriented, speaking to what the customer cares about most, sharing compelling stories, being transparent, having personality, presenting new ideas of empathy. All those help you to engage thoughtfully in a community. And the key to this is hitting your biggest fans, your customers that are most loyal, because that's going to be the catalyst for growth of your community, for building a valuable sales channel. Because those true fans, they're advocates that support your brand in a way that's more powerful and authentic than you can typically achieve through other mechanisms. You'll consider Airbnb. How did they grow? Well, they had a community around their super hosts, helping them out and allowing their super hosts to be truly successful on their platform. Or Twilio, they became the standard for communication APIs through their developer advocates. Or even here at AWS, where our community programs like Heroes have helped to evangelize all things on cloud computing. All these were small programs in organizations that were much smaller at the time when they started. But using community ended up being a catalyst for fast growth. Now, obviously, talking about the power of community, I can talk for hours on this. It's something I'm super passionate about. But unfortunately, I can't talk about all the details in the context of a short 20-minute talk. But I invite, invite you to follow me on LinkedIn, uh, follow my posts about community. And I also wrote a book about this as well, about professional communities called Community in a Box that you can download from most online um, major bookstores and Amazon. And talking about Amazon, in my role at AWS, we powered the infrastructure of the cloud for many companies around the globe, including probably for many of you that are listening right now. And if you're a startup founder in particular, I invite you to a few resources that may help you build faster. The first is our Activate program for both pre-seed founders as well as institutionally funded startups to access support, technical assistance, training, credits. I also blog about sales and go-to-market strategies on the AWS Startups blog. So thanks again. It's truly been an honor to close out this year's Cloud Bazaar conference. I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to speak with you about this topic called authenticity. And I hope you feel inspired as we head into 2021. Once again, my name is Mark Birch at AWS. Take care. Greetings, everyone. Hopefully you got a lot of insights uh, from what I just shared. And uh, I'm really grateful for a lot of the questions that came through. So let me dive in. Uh, the first question is about uh, reviews online. I think this sometimes drives us a lot really crazy. The question itself is, uh, how, do you, uh, how do you differentiate between the, the fake reviews and the, and the positive paid reviewers? You know, how does that affect businesses in the long run? I think the best way to talk about these online reviews is thinking it from the perspective of, don't try to copy what everyone else is doing, right? Because that is exactly why we have these problems of fake reviews and, and the paid reviews, because people feel that they need to have <clears throat> some, some type of content out there. But again, if you double down on thinking about authenticity and many of the points I just shared in the talk, you'll realize that you don't have to go the route that everyone is going to try and just push out content, because that's noise. What really actually cuts through is authentic and real reviews, real content. And so if, you, if we go back to this concept of community, for example, when you build an authentic community, there's people that are gonna want to generate content. Find those super fans, be super helpful to some of those earliest customers that you have and incentivize them to want to contribute in some way, shape, or form. And you build from there. That is your seed to build the community of people who will actually go and comment on an online store. So think about it that way. Think of it as really a, a challenge of how do you build that authentic community of people that will want to contribute and support your business 
and what your mission is. Uh, a second question is, how can businesses look authentic in the age of digitization? Well, obviously, there's many points in my talk that really address this. What I'd say is that concept of building in public, look at that, explore, because the way that you view or anyway, the way people can view you as authentic is if they really see who you are, right? So being authentic in many ways means being transparent. And this whole building in public concept, which has been a more of a recent phenomenon, it actually goes back to the very earliest days of the, the first bloggers. And they were writing stuff about what they were experiencing. And that built huge followings. A good example is there's a, there's a venture capitalist by the name of Fred Wilson in New York. He was one of the very first bloggers that talked about the VC world, which seemed so private and mysterious. But then he started talking about it publicly. And it was so shocking to folks like us who were startup founders. And that instantly created authenticity. And obviously the benefits for Fred and his venture firm, Union Square Ventures, was they had a string of really big exits, one of the most successful venture capital firms in the early stage investing world. So think of it that way. If you're able to be authentic and transparent by building in public, as I mentioned in the talk, start there. That will show people who you really are and that they'll want to, to trust you. Next question is, uh, businesses focus on profits and they may not be authentic in all the ways of how they work. How can businesses maintain a balance between being authentic and maintaining profits? I would actually challenge that presumption. I don't think that's the, that's the right perspective to take. There's no dividing line between being a profitable, successful business and being authentic. Now, this is not to say that all the things that you do as a business will be the right decisions, but that's a different thing. If you start with authenticity, then, then you're going to be on the right path and you're actually going to grow faster. And that's, that's the challenge. People think that they need to hide stuff as opposed to being more transparent. A, a good example is, well, take Amazon. Now, people may look at us as a huge global company, but if you look back at our history and the things that we do, it all comes back down to these core principles that we have called leadership principles. We have 14 of them. And it all starts with customer obsession. And by being obsessed with our customers, it drives all of our decision-making. When I talked in before about working backwards from the customer, that's a core value of, of what we do as Amazonians each and every day. We listen to customers and it comes through in the things that we build. In fact, 90% of our services at AWS are built because we listen to customers and we delivered for them. So I would encourage you to think about your own values of what drives your business and use that as your North Star to being more authentic. Right? And that's a challenge I see with many companies that they have these, these values that they display in a wall or they talk about during their, their employee onboarding. And it seems very high level, very fluffy, very, uh, very ancillary to all the other things you do in your day-to-day -day job. And that's where a lot of businesses go wrong. If you truly embrace values and you have that vision, then the business will both be profitable and will be authentic. So I encourage you, strongly encourage you, 
don't think that you have to do profits or authenticity. They're one and the same. So hopefully it's uh, answered some of the questions that you posed. Uh, really thankful for, again, inviting me here to speak and to share some of my thoughts. This is a topic I'm so very, uh, very passionate about. And uh, with that, take care.